Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Is this a uh, great day? Yeah. Every day is great. Some are greater than others, right? <laughs> well, this is a day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And it is, uh, this is a, a significant place to be. And uh, we have the privilege this morning of being joined by a couple friends. We've already heard from uh, Joe briefly. Uh, we kind of had a... a incident last time when the car turned over so we we didn't have a chance to get all of our time in with joel uh, up across the way but he's here this morning to share with us and also uh, we're going to hear from another friend here in just a moment so we're going to get kind of the prophetic and the geopolitical and so we're going to get you're going to get both barrels this morning so get uh, get ready so please help me welcome my good friend joel rosenberg Tony's a little taller than me. Well, great to be with you guys, uh, and especially here on the southern steps of the temple. Uh, of course, there's no stone left of the actual temple buildings, but this retaining wall is still here. But these steps are the very steps that people would walk uh, up into the temple back 2,000 years ago. These are the, wa uh, the, the, the very stairs that, that Jesus and the apostles walked. And so to study the word of God, to talk about what God is doing here in the region, how we as, uh, as American, North American believers can be a blessing to Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus, to learn what he's doing here, uh, to pray for what God is doing here, to give to the work of uh, ministry here. And usually I say learn, pray, give, and go, but in this case you've gone, so now you've come, so learn, pray, give, and come. But now you want, I want you to go back, not yet, but in a few days, I want you to go back and be ambassadors of, uh, uh, first of what you've seen, what you've heard. Start thinking now about some of the anecdotes, some of the things that God has spoke to you about, some of the scriptures that he's put on your heart. Start making some notes today on the bus, in your journal, because when you get back, what's going to happen is people are going to say, well, what was it like? And you're like, it was great. <laughs> I mean, it was, I mean, how do you describe it? Wow. And then people are going to move on with their lives. They're not going to give you many more opportunities than that. So you should have something like, you know, well, you know one of the things that touched me a lot we were at such and such spot and we studied these scriptures and this meant a lot to me. That will be an encouragement. Uh, so begin to think that way. I would encourage you to have at least three takeaways from this trip, at least, but th that you can go home and that you share. So if they listen to one anecdote or one insight, great. You have got another one right behind it and hopefully a third. So I would encourage you. The other thing is... Um, the front page of the Jerusalem Post this morning. Now, I write fiction, right? I make things up for a living. That's what I do. But, there are, but often when I'm ha having moved here, you can't make things up fast enough. The headline top of the fold of the Jerusalem Post is Prime Minister's newest advisor, a Jew who loves Jesus. Now, I don't know the particular individual. I look forward to meeting him. Uh, I don't know how long his career will last now being on the front page of the Jerusalem Post with that type of description, but pray for him, continue to pray for all the leaders around uh, the Prime Minister and, and all the government as we pray for President Trump and Vice President Pence and all his teams, all their teams as well. Prayer, it is a spiritual battle, not just a geopolitical battle. Uh, the geopolitical wars and, and terrorism and troubles in this region are just physical manifestations of the spiritual battle for the hearts and souls of the people of this region. So keep that in mind as you, uh, in, in, in your prayer time. Uh, I'm going to talk to you for a moment, a moment uh, from Ezekiel 38 and 39. If you've got your Bibles, uh, you know, I'm obviously not going to be able to exposit all, the, all that text, but I want to draw you to some, uh, so, some key prophecies about what's coming to this region. But I'm this is not a shameless plug. There are no bookstores here that sell this, so it's okay. But I recently wrote a book called The Kremlin Conspiracy. And the reason is because uh, after writing 17 years about uh, radical Islamism, apocalyptic Islamism, first of all, I just personally needed a break from that. And so I thought, well, where else is evil rising in our world? And my attention keeps being drawn back to Moscow. Uh, I see in Vladimir Putin a man who sees himself not as a, as a leader uh, of a democratic country by any means. I see him as someone who sees himself as a czar, a czar, a, an authoritarian leader who believes that uh, he is 
you know, perhaps divinely inspired or chosen for the, to lead Russia, but also sees his country from his perspective as a humiliated country, uh, a, a country that is, that is uh, I mean, the population is literally dying. Russia is three million people fewer than the, it was when Putin took over. Why? Because people are not having more children. People are hopeless. 50, most men die before the age of 55. They are dying of alcoholism, uh, drug overdosing, and people aren't having kids because there is hopelessness. And yet there's something in the Russian character historically that if we have an external enemy and we have to make these deep sacrifices for Mother Russia for the sake of the cause, uh, then we will be willing to endure those things. And Putin keeps shifting at people's attention in Russia off of their own problems, many of which he has caused or not solved, because he's spending so much money on wars in Syria and in, you know invading other countries, um, he's to, he's to blame for this, and he's consolidated over the last 18 years all power, authority, and money to himself. Uh, he recently, I'm sure, watched uh, the Chinese give the leader of China you know unlimited reign, and he's thinking, why am I running for office? Uh, you know, even a fake election, I ought to be just controlling this. I don't think we're going to see another Putin election. Uh, Fictionally, I, I, you know, the Kremlin conspiracy allows me to take you down that world. It, you know, it's not Putin, but let's say he's Putin-esque, my, uh, my bad guy in this book. But, uh, and what might a Russian leader do if he has all authority, all power, but needs to keep distracting his people from their own daily economic, personal, social troubles to outside threats? And, you know, just in Putin's tenure, he has invaded... Uh, the, the Republic of Georgia, he's inv and he, he still occupies 20%. He's invaded uh, Crimea, southern Ukraine, and annexed Crimea to Russia. He's invaded or taken over the eastern region of Ukraine, known as the Donbass region, still occupies it. Sent military forces in to work together with Iran and Turkey to take over much of Syria. I mean, this is, you know, and, 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 and if you're a dissident, if you're a journalist that opposes Putin, you, you disappear or die. That's life in, in Russia these days. And my family on my father's side were Orthodox Jews that escaped out of Tsarist Russia under Tsar Nicholas II back around 1906. Uh, we were fortunate as Orthodox Jews to get out of the country and not settle in, in Eastern or Central Europe as many Russians fleeing the, the, the anti-Semitic attacks known as the pogroms in Russia. They, they felt safe in Europe, so they settled only to go through World War I, World War II, and the Holocaust, and a third of the Jewish population being completely liquidated by the Nazis. My family was able to get out of Russia, not settle in Europe, get on a steamship, and wind up in America, and set up shop in Brooklyn like all good Jewish families do. That's yeah. just how it's done. And that's where my father and his brother were raised, and it's in America that we came to faith in Jesus as Messiah. That's where we heard the gospel, because we had that freedom. And, uh, and who knew, uh, from our family's perspective, that God would then bring me, my wife, and my father's grandsons back to the land of Israel to settle here and uh, write, make things up for a living, but also teach the scriptures and preach the gospel. What a tremendous honor. And to do it here with you all uh, is a wonderful thing. Now, one of the prophecies that I keep being drawn back to uh, is, is the prophecies of Ezekiel 38 and 39. I'm going to read a, a, a passage from it just to get us, just to, to, to wet your appetite since it's been a little rainy. But thank the Lord, we need that rain, but just maybe tonight when you're in bed. I mean, I'm just, that's my prayer. Um, let me read a passage uh, of what's known by Bible scholars as the War of Gog, G O G, and Magog. Chapter 38, verse 1, reading out of the New American Standard Bible. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, Set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. I will turn you about, put hooks into your jaws, and bring you out, and all of your army, horses and horsemen, all of them splendidly attired, a great company with buckler and shield, all of them wielding swords. That's how the passage 
begins. Now, for many people, when if you're if you're reading through the Bible, let's like, say on an annual plan, and you get to that, most people will go, yeah, moving on, moving on, Gog, Magog. I'm a Gog just thinking about it. I have no idea what that means. I don't get it. I'm moving on. I'm going to go back to the Beatitudes. I might not be doing them all, but at least I understand, you know, what they're saying. This is one of the challenges of studying prophecy. Sometimes you have these, these words that are they're old and they don't make immediate sense and people get bogged down and they get nervous, so they skip it. The problem is that 27% of scripture is prophecy. 27%, that's one out of four verses in the Bible is prophecy. Now half of those have come true. And a big chunk of those are messianic prophecies, how we know that Jesus Yeshua is in fact the Messiah that we have all waited for and has transformed our lives. And, uh, and many other prophecies have come true as well, about half of all prophecies in the Bible. But there are half still to come. Most of those deal with the time that we're living into up to the second coming of Christ, right over there. Amen. Um, how, often, how often can you say that? I mean, yeah. right there. <laughs> Amazing. Split that mountain to, rip it open, defeat the Antichrist, win, and then set up his fourth temple uh, and, and reign over the entire world from Jerusalem, right? Not from Washington. And at that point, for a thousand years, no political ads, no political fundraisers, no, no elections, no debates. This, this is very exciting, right? So come Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. I know you're like, just a couple more days, I just want to get my money's worth out of this trip. I, I understand. <laughs> now, we need to study prophecy even if we don't immediately understand it. I, I, I can't unpack for this, this for you, you know, in a verse-by-verse in a -verse expository way today. But I want to draw out a few thoughts for you to mull on. And I encourage you, spend some time in the next 24, 48 hours just reading through Ezekiel 38 and 39. Gog. Gog is, and I walk this through, by the way, in my nonfiction book from 10 years ago, Epicenter. Okay, so if you need to go drill into the actual historical detective work and all the end notes and footnotes, whatever, that's that. But here's the executive summary Gog is not a name, it's not a personal name. We're not looking for Fred Gog, we're not looking for Tony Gog or Ahmed or Dimitri Gog. This is not, no, the Gog is a title, like Pharaoh or Tsar. Okay? It's, it's a, we're looking for a figure, not a specific name. Okay? Now, when we, when we learn about, what do we learn about Gog? Well, he's from the land of Magog. You're like, yeah, Joel, that's not helping me any. <laughs> so, that, okay. Now, if you do the historical detective work, mm -hmm. what you find out is in the first century, the ancient Roman historian Josephus, writing 2,000 years ago, wrote that the Magogites, the people of this, you know, Magog is a name, by the way, it's a, it's a family name, and it comes from Genesis 10, the table of nations, this is a descendant of Noah. So the question becomes, what is this nation, this family, where do they spread out to and where do they settle? And Josephus wrote that they, <coughs> they moved from the Middle East and they moved north and they settled north of the Black Sea, north of the Caspian Sea, in the region we today call Russia and some of the former Soviet republics. So this begins to give you a sense you're looking for a leader from the area of Russia and some of those other regions uh, north of Israel. Now, as you go through it, what you find also is uh, several verses say he comes with his army from the remotest parts of the north. The remotest parts of the north. Well, if you picked out a map, if you Googled a map right now and you went to Jerusalem and you go due north as far as you can go to find a major city, that's Moscow. Okay. If you go any further, you hit the North Pole. So I tell my Canadian friends, you guys are in the clear. You're not, you're not where Magog, you're not Magog, because that's going south. Once you hit the North Pole, you're going, going south. So you have to be going north from Jerusalem. That's the relative point here. You're in Russia. Now we also learn in, um, in one of these verses, uh, um, in verse 10, we learn that Gog is going to devise an evil plan. So he's, Gog is one of the Bible bad guys, okay? Now, he, so he's from a certain territory, Russia and the environs up there. He's evil. He's got an evil plan. God says, I'm against you. That's pretty clear. You don't want God to ever say that about you. But if you find someone in the Bible who's coming, whom God is against, that's important to know about. We know that uh, then he builds a coalition. Again, he, the first country mentioned is Persia, verse 5. Well, that's the easiest country in the list of the coalition countries to identify because until 1935, Persia was the official legal name of the country we today call the Islamic Republic of Iran. 
So Russia and Iran are supposed to form an alliance. Now, they haven't in 2,500 years since this prophecy was written by the Hebrew prophet Ezekiel back in Babylon. But starting in the mid-1990s and accelerating in the year 2000 when Vladimir Putin came to power in Russia, the Russian-Iranian alliance has forged. Forged. It's, it's, it, it's never happened in all of human history, but it's happening today. And right in Syria, right now, Russia and Iran have formed an alliance to help prop up the evil regime of Bashar al-Assad, who through that war has slaughtered uh, half a million people. A ten, at least 10 million Syrians are on the run for their lives. We are watching the implosion of the modern state of Syria. I'm sure that Chris will pick up on that a little bit. So, uh, but just think about Russia and Iran never having an alliance. Now they do, and there they are. You were up on the Golan Heights. I believe General Boykin was teaching with you in the Valley of Tears, and you could see Syria. As you were sitting there in that little amphitheater, you're looking out, that's Syria. That is a country controlled by Russia and Iran today. Effectively, Syria doesn't exist today as a geopolitical entity. I mean, t legally it does, but it, it is imploded, and it is essentially a Russian-Iranian province. There you go. Uh, the, the only mm. other major player up there is Turkey. And oh, here we find Turkey in the Bible, verse 6, oh. Gomer. <laughs> Gomer is not where Gomer Pyle is from. There, some people <laughs> misunderstand that. But actually, Gomer is an ancient name for the people of the, we now call Turkey. So you have Russia, Iran, Turkey forming an alliance with their military forces just up across the northern border of Israel. Yes, that's where we are today. Now, some of the other countries mentioned, uh, your Bibles might say Ethiopia in verse 5, but uh, the actual Hebrew word is Cush, and Cush c can include Ethiopia, but e ancient Ethiopia was an empire. What, what it really is, uh, Cush is the Upper Nile region, meaning the region south of Egypt, uh, what we now call as Sudan. Could it include Ethiopia? It could. Could it include Eritrea? It could, but primarily it's Sudan. Well, Sudan is a very close ally of Russia and Iran today. It's a radical Islamist regime. Uh, verse 5, you also see put. Uh, where do we put put? Well, ancient <laughs> prophecy or ancient historian Josephus, first century, writes that put is ancient Libyos, what we now today call Libya. It might have at that time probably extended into Algeria, so that's possible, but at least it's Libya. Libya that is imploded, Libya that's controlled by radical Islamism, that, that, that ISIS is taking over, that is closely tied to Russia and Iran. Now, this is the short version, and I'm just giving you as, as a few examples to say, and I want to be careful, I want to be clear with you, just because all of these forces are, are converging for the first time in 2,500 years since this prophecy was written does not mean that necessarily we're seeing the prophecy come true soon or even in our lifetime. God in his prophetic sovereign wisdom could kick the prophetic can up the road 50 years, 100 years or more. That's possible. Therefore, we don't want to jump to a conclusion. This is how much a prophecy gets discredited in the evangelical church, because people either, why are many pastors not teaching it? In part because there's lunatics out there, right? The, numero the Christian numerologist that said that the rapture in the end of the world would happen on the 23rd? What's today? Yeah. I mean, here we are, right? It, it, this stuff is nonsense. And stuff like that causes many evangelical leaders to say, I'm just going to stay away from prophecy. I don't want to be linked to the prophecy nuts. Well, I, I, I'm sympathetic to that point, but there are people who preach the gospel with heresy, right? And, and, but we don't say, well, we're not going to preach the gospel because we don't want to be identified with the gospel nuts. You know, the lunatics who are, you know, telling you that, you know, believe in Jesus and you'll get a Learjet and a Rolex. Okay, that's ridiculous. <laughs> Nevertheless, we don't, we, we, you know, we don't stop preaching the gospel, nor should we top, stop teaching 27% of scripture. It's never healthy to, to, to take 24% out of God's word out of your life. If you, if you, te if you have a teenage daughter and you teach her 27% less of what she needs to know to drive a car safely, is that helping her? What about the people on the road around her? If you run a medical school are you, and you teach your students 27% less of what they need to know to save lives, are you helping the future doctors of the world? What about the patients? It is dangerous to, to excise 27% of the Bible out of your quiet times and out of our teaching. It's like Thomas Jefferson taking a, a scissor and going, click, 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 I don't, I don't want that part. That's a problem. 
And yet, that, that, that is essentially creeping into evangelicalism. So we have to be careful. We have to be very careful. Now, when you look at the prophecies, again, the, the short version is, as you read this through, what you'll find is that this, this, there's a prerequisite, several, before this, this uh, alliance can form and actually come and attack Israel. That's, that's the focus of the plan that this Russian dictator has. And it says it, uh, in the text, uh, in verse 16, that this will happen in the last days. But as you read it through, what you'll see is the prerequisites are, Israel has to be reconstituted as a sovereign state before this can happen. Jews have to be coming back to the land after centuries of exile before this can happen. <coughs> they have to be making, rebuilding the ancient ruins. They have to be making the deserts bloom. They have to be prosperous more than they ever have. And they have to feel secure. The text never talks about there being peace yet, but it talks about it, Jews are living securely in the land. We are living securely in the land. I can't tell you again that that means that the whole list has been checked off and we're ready for the war of Gog and Magog. We could be. Is, people have been asking me on this book tour for the Kremlin conspiracy, is Putin Gog? I said, I don't know. I, it's too early to say. Is he Gog-esque? Yes, he is Gog-esque. Would I be shocked if he turns out to be Gog? I would not be shocked, but, I, but it's too early. And so why discredit ourselves and, become, you know, and just jump to a conclusion? We don't have to. But if he, if he starts attacking Israel, then we'll know. We'll also know that he loses. What happens here is this coalition forms and surrounds Israel in the last days. Now think about this. this. If this prophecy couldn't have happened until Israel was reconstituted, here we are. Until Israel has sovereignty over the land, feels secure. You know, we have a peace treaty with Egypt. We have a peace treaty with Jordan. And of course, Tony was just with us uh, last fall, uh, as was Michelle and, and Jerry for part of it, sitting with President El Sisi and talking about, he, he was telling us how close this relationship is with Israel. Sitting for lunch across the river with the King of Jordan, talking about, you know, yeah, the tension, challenges. These are not Zionists over there. But they have a relationship, a secure, peaceful relationship with Israel. This is not normal in history. And Egypt, by the way, is never mentioned in the text. And Egypt has been the main threat to the Jewish people going back to, you know, Charlton Hessen taking on Yul Brenner. You, you understand what I'm saying? It just That's been 5,000 years of, of tensions, right? But what has happened? We're in a moment, we're in a window of history where Egypt is not an enemy. We're Jordan, not an enemy. Where the Arab states, the United Arab Emirates and the Saudis are increasingly shifting. You heard it from Caroline Glick the other night. They are not seeing Israel as a threat. They're not preparing for war with Israel. They're preparing for war with Iran. And they're terrified that Russia, the world's main nuclear armed power, aside from the United States, is forming this alliance with their worst enemies. This is creating a convergence of interests. Uh, one that you find as you go through the text, you will not find the Arab countries primarily participating in the coalition. Iran is not an Arab country, it's Persian. Turkey's not an Arab country, it's, it's, um, it's, it's Turkish. <laughs> um, <laughs> Libya is, Sudan is, so, but, it's, but you don't see, like Sheba and Dedan are mentioned. That's, the, that's Saudi and the Gulf states. They're, they're engaged in a conversation, why are you doing this, Gog? They're not part of the coalition. They're wondering, why is this happening? So this will happen at one point, and I cannot rule out, let's just put it this way, I cannot rule out the possibility that this could happen in the next few years or the next few decades. I'm not saying it will, but it's something we have to watch and we have to understand as the United States under President Trump, who's doing so much more right than I thought he would. Okay? Yes. I, I was a never Trumper until Thursday, well, not last Thursday, but the Thursday before the election. I was very cautious. I didn't see anything in his experience or character or statements that made me think he would do the good things that he's done or hire the good people that he has. I'm very encouraged. But I also see him preparing to pull out of Syria, which is essentially ceding this territory to Russia and Iran for sure forever. This is a problem. Okay? So while he's doing many things right, there is also a dynamic that is consistent with the scriptures. No country comes to Israel's defense when this coalition emerges. You don't see any country, not the EU, not NATO, not the UN, not the United States. Israel is alone at this moment. And, but, but God will supernaturally intervene 
And as much as I'd love to walk you through how that plays out, I can't, not now. So I'm going to turn it over to Chris. But I'm going to close with this thought. These are just thoughts for I want you to, 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 to mull and say, well, how do we, because there's, a, there's an action point here. How do we love Israel and her neighbors and strengthen the church and proclaim the gospel and teach the word of God and, and, and care for persecuted Christians in the region before judgments fall? The, this text says this coalition will form, but that God will himself will supernaturally intervene and he will bring fire down from heaven. He will cause terrible earthquakes, disease to spread among the enemy nations. He will personally defeat this coalition. And, and chapter 39 says he will do it in the sight of all nations. He says all nations will see my glory. How is that possible? It's possible because of global satellite television technology. Never in history have we been in a window where all people could see it. And I wrap up with this last verse from Ezekiel 39. This is the hope. Quote, from the, the Lord says, I will not hide my face from them, from the Jewish people, any longer at this point in history. Why? For I will have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, declares the Lord. When this plays out, God is going to not only save Israel physically, he's going to begin to dramatically increase the salvation of Israel spiritually as he pours out his spirit and our eyes, the eyes of my people, begin to open in ways that have never happened since the first century. We can pray for this. We can plant seeds now. Thank you for not only standing with Israel, but standing or, like again, in this case, sitting uh, in Israel. God bless you guys. <laughs> Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Joel Rosenberg, for being with us this morning. See, prophecy is unfolding before our eyes, right? We're seeing the Bible come alive. We've seen it on this trip. We've seen the vines and the hills of Samaria. We're seeing the nation of Israel coming back together and arising. Now, we don't know how it's all going to unfold, but two things we know, it is unfolding. And the second is that we should be praying more than ever before that we um, are prepared for what God is doing. And I hope that's one of the messages that you take home.